All right. Let's uh, let's grab our Bibles and turn to Acts. And we are in chapter 24. Acts 24. Paul, his ministry has changed because his ministry has now moved from that of being a preacher to being a prisoner. But what's interesting is that God will use that ministry with him as a prisoner to go so much further than he'd ever had as just a preacher. And God takes the things that seem hardest, the things that we face that seem the most um, uh, difficult, and God takes those and can turn them to be something of great value in ministry. So uh, I, I think in Paul's life that there's one thing that I see in his life is he never got discouraged, even though God may change his plans. What's God's goal for Paul at this point where we're reading in Acts chapter 24? What's, what's God's goal for him? To go to Rome. God, God's already told him he's going to preach in Rome. He's going to give testimony in Rome is what he's told him. And he doesn't know how he's going to get there. And right now he's a prisoner and he sure doesn't know. The uh, people at Jerusalem have attacked him and uh, they wanted to kill him. The, the 40 uh, starving men now are... They wanted, to, they wanted to kill him. I don't know what happened to them, but uh, they bring him to uh, Festus. And, uh, is that right? Festus, right? Yeah. They bring him to Festus, and their sh lawyer shows up, and that's verse 2. And we talked about that last week, and he talks lawyer talk. And he, he sets up uh, with Felix, you know, this idea that now, uh, as Paul has been brought there to Felix in uh, Caesarea, that uh, now Felix can take this and do something with it. And Paul, verse 10, Then Paul, after that, the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, I like Paul's answer, For as much as I know that thou hast been many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. I just like that answer, don't you? I can almost hear Paul with a grin on his face. I'm so glad you asked. I, I'm so glad I get to tell you what happened. And then he says, verse 11, here's where we left off last week. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. <coughs> so they had brought all these accusations about how he, had, he would come to Jerusalem and he had carried Gentiles into the temple and he had tried to stir up a big mob there and a riot and all the rest. And what Paul's saying is, is he said, Festus, the truth is, I haven't had time to do all those things. He said, I've been gone 12 days. I was five days in Caesarea, verse 11 tells us. He was two days in traveling, so that only left five days in Jerusalem. That's just not enough time for a riot or for him to gather up enough people to start some kind of problem. Yeah. And so he says to Fitz, I just hadn't had time. Come on. You, you know, this is the way it is. Verse 12. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. They didn't have time. Plus he said, they, they have no proof. They have no proof. They haven't found that. And they never saw me in these things because he didn't do it. Verse 13, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. He was, um, he was in the temple, by the way, remember, because he was told by the apostles that he ought to uh, join up with those seven men. I think it was seven men or four men. And they were, to, they were in the, the rite of purification. And so he was in the temple with them, but they were the only ones he was with. And that was by their leadership, not something he chose to do. Verse 14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way... Now, you need to circle that. The way. When you see that in Scripture, you know what he's referring to? Christianity. Christianity the way. That's what it was referred to before it was called Christianity. Before they were called Christians. The way. They were part of the way. That was, their, that was, the, that was what made it up. The way, and so he's referring to Christianity. He says, I confess to thee that after the way, 
which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And, here, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Paul's just basically saying, he said, look, he said, you need to understand something. He said, I've not violated the law of God. I've not done anything that's, uh, that is worthy of, of what they want to do to me. Uh, I, I, I have stood for the resurrection. I've stood for that which I believe in, the resurrection. And that was what he got in trouble with because he preached the resurrection of Christ. But here he's not talking about the resurrection of Christ. He's talking about the resurrection of the just and unjust. Did you see that? Can I give you some information about the resurrections? Some people are really confused about this. But we will be resurrected. Amen? Amen. I may die. You may put my body in a grave. But I promise you this. There's a day coming when I will be resurrected. I will come out of that grave. I will be given a new body. It's going to be an awesome thing. Whenever I preach a funeral service, I usually always like to bring up some of these texts I'm going to give you in just a second. Because I think it's important for people to understand that this death, this dying thing, this laying me in a casket, putting me in the ground, doesn't end, any, doesn't end anything. I'm just, that, that old body's just waiting for Jesus to come back to get him. Now, I'm already with the Lord. You know, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I know as a spirit, I, my spirit is already connected with God. But when Jesus comes back, I get a new body. Let me share some things with you. First of all, and I thought this was really cool. Let's talk about the, the resurrection of the redeemed, of the just. I'm going to call it the first resurrection, okay? The first resurrection. It begins with the resurrection of... Of those who were resurrected at Christ's resurrection. Take your Bible. Go to Matthew. This is really interesting, I think. Matthew chapter 27. And look down to verse 51 and 52. Matthew 27. Have I got that right? 51, 52. Talk about it. And the graves were open. Yes, that's good. Yes, thank you. 51. Well, let's go 50 and 51. Let's start 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. There he is on the cross, right? And uh, Jesus, and, and behold, verse 51, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. And went into the holy city and peered unto many. Ah, boy, I tell you what, nowadays we say the zombies came out. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. But this is the this is this is the first resurrection. And it wasn't zombies, by the way. They had they were they came out. And they this was this was was God delivering these. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some information. I want to give you some just this is just some good stuff. And and so many people just don't know this. They they've never thought this way. But I I want you to understand it. Old Testament believers did not go to heaven. Does that shock? You don't, don't let that shock you. They didn't go to heaven. Why? Because the price had not been paid. You see, they needed a savior. They needed the blood of the lamb to be shed. Well, all the way through the Old Testament, about 4,000 years, the lamb, they offered lambs all the time, but those, that wasn't the Lamb of God. It was a picture of the Lamb of God. And by faith, they offered that, knowing that someday God would provide that supreme sacrifice. So all the Old Testament saints, when they died, went to a place you've heard of. Paradise. Abraham's bosom. Where is that? Well, if you read about the rich, uh, the, the, um, the rich man who died, you remember? Yeah. It says that he looked over into Abraham's bosom. And there was a great gulf fix between him and Abraham. So where was Lazarus? He was in Abraham's bosom, but he was inside of those that were in hell. So we, we would believe, I believe, that that paradise was a part of hell. 
It wasn't the part that was suffering, but it was there in that area waiting for the redemption to come. So let's say I go back. I'm going to go all the way back. I'm, 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 a, I'm a, a, a believer, uh, Old Testament believer, and um, let's say I lived the time of Abraham, okay? So here I am. Abraham's on the face of the earth, and we're, uh, let's see, I guess we're probably about, uh, well, we're over a thousand years, about a thousand years or longer for, before Jesus comes. And I die. So I've been faithful to bring my sacrifice. I put my faith in what God said to do. And so when I die, I go, my spirit goes, and my body goes in the grave, my spirit goes to this place called paradise or Abraham's bosom. And I sit and I wait. I'm there when Lazarus shows up, amen? I'm there whenever I hear, I hear Lazarus and the, I hear the rich man and how he cries out for Lazarus to come. And cool this I'm, I'm there. I hear all that. You know, I, I've been there a thousand years. I'm waiting. One day, <laughs> one day, we're all sitting around waiting on the sacrifice to be made. And all of a sudden, guess what happens? Jesus shows up. The Lamb of God. And he said, come on. We're going out of here. And this is the this is the second this is the this is the first part of the resur- of the first resurrection. This is the first part of the first resurrection. And these are those believing Jews that have been waiting. And during that time when Christ dies and, and uh, whenever he's resurrected, he takes captivity with him. And they now go to the presence of God, what we call heaven. There they are in spirit in heaven. They still haven't received their glorified bodies. That's coming. But they are, they are there. They have, they have obtained that part of the resurrection. Now then, so that's called the first part. And I'm going to give you three parts to the first resurrection, okay? The first resurrection takes a long time. It's, it starts here and it continues. And this would be considered the first fruits of the resurrection. The first fruits. This is the first ones. These are the first ones that go. Now then, there'll be a large number that will go at the rapture. So these are those at the rapture. Let's talk about that. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. I'm sorry. Those were resurrected bodily. Then we saw them. Now then, watch what happens at the rapture. These are the Christians. These are those who are saved from the time of Christ's resurrection. 1 Thessalonians Thessalonians 4, verse 16. Let me get there. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 4. This is a good passage. Let's go back. Uh, let's look at verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those who have died, that you saw not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That's spirits, spirits coming with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So those who are asleep, they are those who are already laid in the grave. Now the spirit is already with God, he says he brings them with him, but their bodies have laid to sleep, they are asleep, and uh, they're dead. And uh, verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Woo! Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now then, all the, 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 those of the believers of the Old Testament were resurrected first. That's the first fruits. And if you look at the way uh, they harvested, the first fruits was the first part of the, the harvest. It's the first thing they brought in. But then there's the harvest. And now this is the harvest. It takes place, we call it the rapture, when the majority, the biggest group's going to go. It's all of those who've died and that in Christ uh, to this point or to the point of the rapture. And then everybody that's alive that has Christ in their life, they'll also be raptured. And we will be changed, he says. Uh, in fact, let's look over. Uh, 
Uh, let's look over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And notice what it says here. 1 Corinthians 15. In verse uh, 51, I behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. That's because we're going to get a new body, a resurrected body. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And this corruptible, this old flesh and body we've got, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption has, shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen? So we have the first part of the resurrection is those who were raised as a part of Jesus' resurrection when He resurrects those Old Testament saints. Then there's coming a second part of the resurrection, which is all those who are, have died and are living when Christ comes back to take His church out. It was what's called the rapture. That takes place seven years before the second coming. Okay? Some people think the rapture is the second coming. No, it's the rapture. It's, it's, it's not the second coming. Second coming is when Jesus comes comes at the end of the tribulation and establishes his kingdom here on earth. But this is the rapture. And this is a large group. I mean, it's everybody from, from Christ's death, burial, and resurrection to now and those who are living. So this is the mass of people. And that's the harvest. I call that the harvest. And then we have verse uh, the third part of this resurrection, which takes place at the end of the tribulation. So are you with me? The, the, the resurrection starts when Jesus is resurrected from the grave. Then those who are resurrected at the rapture. And then there's another group that's going to be raised at the end of the tribulation. Now, for that, let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15. You're there. Look at verse 20 and 23. It says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. See, there's the first fruits. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. But as, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. First resurrection. Second part of that first resurrection. Then the third part, the end time. They've all got to be resurrected. They've all got to get new bodies. And he says, in order, Christ the first fruits. Afterwards, they that are Christ at His coming. So then we have, and then cometh the end when He shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, which shall have put down all rule and authority and power. So we have three different times that we're talking about there, okay? Are y'all still with me? Yeah. Okay, so now then let's look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 through 5. We're going to be in Revelation at the end of this probably. Revelation 20. Verse 4. Yeah, Revelation chapter 20. Verse 4. And I saw the thrones, and they sat upon them, and the judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So these are those that can be resurrected who died or were martyred during the seven-year tribulation. There are going to be a lot of Christians killed during that time. You know that, right? I mean, you're not going to be able to buy food. You're not going to be able to get get physical, uh, any kind of a, a physician's help. There's, you know, you're you're going to be put out there. And if well, you're not, excuse me, you're not right. 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 You're going to be gone. But the ones that are saved during those that are saved during the tribulation, the tribulation right. and those are those that that will be saved. We know that there's going to be saved. There's two great witnesses that are coming, and there's 144,000 witnesses. The 144,000 Jews during the tribulation are going to be witnesses. Do you know that that's, do you know how many missionaries there are in the world today? About 35,000. Now think about that. He said there are going to be 144,000 during the tribulation witnessing for Christ. Wow. That's about three to three times, three to four times, almost three to four times the amount of missionaries we have will be in this world sharing and witnessing for Christ. And these two. Uh, the two uh, witnesses will be 
major because they will be doing like major miracles. And and, it'll be like, I don't know how many po- population will be here. So they'll have there'll be a bunch gone, yeah. There. So I it's going to, yeah. Hopefully, that's hopefully true. more than half. Don't know, but it's going to be a bunch who are going to get saved. But then they're going to be, many of them die or be killed because of their faith. And uh, so we understand that. By the way, just, just a side note, let me just throw this in. You've been listening to the theories about the COVID vaccination that they're going to implant you with some kind of something marker. And I've, somebody said, oh, that's the mark of the beast. Let me tell you, you don't have to worry about the mark of the beast because that doesn't happen until the, the Antichrist comes and he doesn't show up till we're gone. So don't worry about the mark of the beast on you, all right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Kate, Kate have it, so it's yeah. All right, so that's just that's that side. You can throw that out now. That, that's I just threw that in there for you, just so you know. It is, yes, yes. It could be. I don't. It just is six 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 is what the Bible says. Whether it's tattooed on or however it's done, but all the all the theories that you're hearing about that. Uh, that's scaring Christians to death. If you're a Christian, you don't have to worry about it. You're going to be gone. Amen. So it's not going to happen. But Amen. notice this. All right, verse, uh, where am I at? Verse 4, the thrones. Okay, I, I was in verse 4. Let me just go ahead. I'll start over. I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither is his, his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The thousand year reign of Christ takes place at the end of the tribulation. Jesus comes. He establishes his kingdom here. And for a thousand years he reigns. And all of those who are resurrected during the tribulation, who have died during the tribulation, all of those who are resurrected during that time are going to sit upon thrones and rule with him during that time. So are we, by the way. Uh, verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years was finished. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead, well, wait a minute, who are they? Well, let's see. All the Old Testament believers have resurrected. All those that uh, were raptured, they've been resurrected. So they're, they're not in the graves anymore. And all of those who died during the tribulation, that they, uh, they've been resurrected. So they're not in the graves. So who's left in the graves? All non-believers. So here's this poor non-believer from way back in the time of Adam and Eve. He's been stuck in the grave. He's been stuck in this place called hell. And he's been there all this time because he chose not to believe God. And now all of a sudden we come, here we are 6,000 years later, basically. And, uh, and as, as these are resurrected, they're still there. Another thousand years before they get resurrected. That's a long time, isn't it? It's nothing compared to eternity. So what's going to happen to them? Well, let's go down to verse uh, verse 5. says, But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years was finished. Then let's drop down to verse um, four, thir- 12. Verse 12. Let's look, at verse, let's look at verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now the dead that we're talking about there are not the saved. Some people read this and they think, there, that's, that's the judgment. We're going to stand before God. And he's going to see if our name's in the books. And he's going to, no. Because Romans 8, 1 tells us there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. There's no such thing. We've been bought and paid for. It's done. Your judgment is taken care of. Just look at the cross. That's done. But those who've died without Christ, those who've died without this, this salvation that God has offered... They will stand before that judge. And this is those dead that we talked about. They are those who have died without Christ. And they've been in the grave all this time. Now they're brought before God. Every man according to... And they're going to be judged. Every man according to their works. I'm not going to be judged according to my works. 
Absolutely not. My works don't save me. Why would I be judged for my works? The only judgment I get for my works is the judgment seat of Christ. And it's not my works that I get judged for there. It's what Christ did through me. It's not even mine. I can't even claim it. But these guys, they've lived their life thinking that in some way they're going to be good enough to go to heaven. They're going to try to keep the works. They're going to try to obey the laws. And if they do just, if, they're, if they get there and, it, and their good outweighs their bad, then they're going to get to go to heaven. It does not work that way. Because the good they've got to have is the goodness of God. They've got to be as perfect as God. And if they have one sin, guess what happens to the, the scales? I mean, they've got this gone, right? So they're gone. So, but God is going to give them the opportunity to plead their case. He's going to bring out the books of their works. The, the books he talks about. The books according to their works. Uh, every man according to their works. Um, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. And this is the second death. So this is that resurrection of the unjust. And they're brought before God. They're judged by their works. And those that are found guilty, which are all of them, are sent to the lake of fire. But believe me, they're not sent to the lake of fire because they, didn't, they weren't good enough. They were sent to the lake of fire because their name wasn't written in the book of life. Because they refused to receive the gift that God offered. That's what happens. That's what verse 15 says. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. It didn't say those who were found with all kinds of works that weren't good enough. It doesn't say that. It says their name wasn't written in the book of life. That's why they're sent to the lake of fire. A person doesn't go to hell because of their works they go to hell because they refuse Christ That's right. period Truth. works can't save you and works doesn't send you to hell no. it's the rejection of Jesus Christ that is the unpardonable sin yes. the only one mm. wow the two resurrections as we've seen here alright let's go back to our text Let's see if we can move just a little further. Um, I like what Paul says, verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and towards man. And basically he was just telling Fest uh, Festus. Is it Festus? Yes. I, see, Felix is coming up. And so I keep thinking of him. Felix or Festus? Felix or Festus? It's Festus. It's Matt Dillon's buddy. Uh, <laughs> Festus, right? That's what I got to remember. That's how I remember that. Festus. <laughs> Mr. Dillon, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> what version or what verse? I'm looking at verse 16 in our text of Acts 24. Acts 24, verse 16. Paul had a good conscience about how he lived before God and how he lived for man. Was he perfect? No, he wasn't perfect. But I'll tell you something about Paul. Paul was committed to being obedient to God. I don't think there's a question about that. Verse 17. Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. Whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple. Neither with multitude nor with tumult. He said yeah there were those who found me in the temple. I was in there in this act of purification. Verse 19. Who ought to have been here before thee. The ones that were accused him in Jerusalem. Of the fact that they said they saw him in the temple with Gentiles. He said they're not even here to accuse me. Where are they? They're not there. They should have been there. But they weren't. He says. Uh, they verse, verse 19. Who ought to have been here before thee. And object if they have ought against me. Or else let these same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council. Basically, where's your proof? Where's the evidence? I mean, if there was ever a time a need for somebody to have a sign outside the courtroom saying, where's the evidence? This would be the case, right? Where's the evidence? You say Paul did it. Where's the evidence? Where's the people? Where's your, where's your uh, first-hand account? They didn't have it. And... Um, he said, uh, verse uh, 21, Except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, 
touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called into question by you this day. So Paul says, the only reason I'm here is because I preached the resurrection. I preached about a dead man who was resurrected from the grave. Of course, his name was Jesus. And he said, that's why I'm here today, because these don't want to agree that Jesus is alive. Verse 22, and when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will now, I will know the uttermost parts of your matter. So basically, I think he realizes this is kind of a, this is a, this is a, a, it's a, it's a kangaroo court. It's not, they're not presenting anything that really says he deserves to die or that he even deserves to be maybe mishandled. Uh, he is, he's, and the fact that Felix, he said, heard these things having more n perfect knowledge of that way. See, he understood about the conflict that was going on between the Jews and the, and the, and the uh, Christians. He understood that because he'd been firsthand and he had seen it. And so uh, he's going to try to, let's put, let's put this thing to bed for a little bit and I'll wait till Lysias comes out. Well, remember, Lysias is the chief captain and he's waiting for him to get there. And so what does he do? He commanded a centurion to keep Paul. Now, that's just one soldier. Says, here, I put you in charge. You are going to be his keeper. You keep him. Not going to put him in prison. He's going to go with the centurion. Wherever the centurion goes. And listen to this. And to let him have liberty. What do you think this judge has about Paul? I think he has a good feeling about Paul, don't you? I mean, if he thought he was a murderer, if he thought he was a rioter, if he thought he was going to cause problems, I don't think he would have done this. But instead, he tells him, you keep Paul and kind of keep him under house arrest and don't, don't limit people from coming to see him. He says, and let him have liberty and that he should, be, and, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintances to minister or come unto him. So I'm going to stop there. But so, so Paul is left now in the hands of this one centurion. And uh, he can visit. What's, let me ask you, what's going to happen to the centurion? What's, man, that guy's going to be, he's going to have, he's going to be inundated with witnesses. Yeah. People coming and talking to Paul. And Paul telling him about Christ. And telling him about the resurrection of Jesus. And about all the things that are going on. And Paul's probably going to lead this guy to the Lord. No, we don't have that in there. But I just feel like that you almost have to say that that's what would happen. Because there's going to be all kinds of things going on. And uh, Paul's going to have all his, all his, Buddies come and they're going to pray together and they're going to talk about the word of God and they're going to talk about Jesus and here's this centurion sitting there he's going to have to hear it all captive audience and uh, so uh, it wasn't Paul that was in prison it may have been the centurion but well, what a prison to be in be sitting there a, a novel called the centurion oh really it was based on this you know what happened really that's cool I think that'd be neat <laughs> neat idea for a book well all right. Good. Any question, comment, or thought? I didn't cover a lot tonight, but we got we got a little ways down the list. Any question, comment, or thought? Okay. Yes. WM. I've been advertising every morning, but uh, WM Friday night six thirty. Please be here, ladies, to help in getting things finished up with the toy store. They, they're over there working on it tonight. The kids are. And then uh, there'll be some working on it tomorrow. And then we're counting on you ladies to come and get it all finished up. You know how to do it. It'll be the clothing and accessory swap that night. Oh, okay, great. So you have a clothing and accessory swap that night, too. How about that? You can come and get you some clothes to take home with you. That'll be great. So it'll be a lot of fun. 6.30, Friday night, WOM, don't forget. And then Toy Store, Saturday, starts at 8.30. Eight. Starts at 8 o'clock. <laughs> and lasts till 2. <laughs> yeah, till 2. And then we start taking the walk-ins. And we have a number of walk-ins coming. They've been calling almost every day. So it probably will be planned. If you plan to come, plan to come and stay Till at least three, maybe a little longer, to get finished up. But uh, we need help. Uh, we found that some wait to come later, which is fine. 
if you come later, plan to stay and help get everything cleaned up. We need a crew to do that. And uh, so you say, well, I'm not much of a rapper. I'm not much of a rapper, but I can, I can push a broom or I can, load some, I can load some trash up. Then why don't you wait and come later in the afternoon, come about 1.30 or 1.00 and stay then till, till it closes, and that would be a big help to us. Or show up at 3 and help us, whatever, whatever time you get here. Or stay all day, yeah, yeah, stay all day. Just enjoy. There's gonna, I know that they have, uh, they have a lot of Christmas stuff. They'll have, uh, uh, they'll have hot chocolate, <coughs> candy canes, and the hot chocolate will have marshmallows until they're gone. Music, a lot of music. We'll have little elves, elves running. We'll have the, the rappers will be rapping with music. With music. Yes. yes. And so uh, that'll be something to see. So it'll be a lot of fun. We'll be entertaining. It will be. Plus you'll be ministering to our church family, to our community. All right. If there's no, any other question, come in a thought. I just got a text that the train's blocking the crossover here. Oh. The traffic is really backing up. So if you're going that way, why don't you go ahead and just come on and join us in the choir, you know? That'd be good. So uh, anyway, you're going to be blocked from going that way. You might be able to go around if you go through Jameson Road that way. Okay, let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer then. Good group tonight, amen? This is a great Wednesday night. You have encouraged your preacher with your faithfulness tonight. Thank you for coming. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the, what we've listened, what we've heard. For your word, Father, how, how we, we've been able, Father, to gain these things from it. Thank you, Lord, that we are going to be a part of a resurrection that will take us out of here. Give us a new body. And we will walk with you and stay with you for all eternity. We look forward to that day. But until that day comes, Lord, might we feel the need to share Christ with others. And uh, make sure that everybody has the opportunity to receive you as their Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Pray, Lord, you'll continue to bless. Keep us safe and bless this weekend, Father, as we have the Christmas store. May it be a blessing to many. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you.